The central desert is a vast desert 200 million years later. Its surface is an inhospitable environment, but life has adapted to survive the extreme temperatures and lack of water. It is a wilderness of drifting sand seas, sun-cracked stones and shattered gravel. Unbearable extremes of heat and dryness combine to produce the most hostile living conditions. There are no clouds and the summer sun sears the bare rocks and sand so that temperatures reach a withering 50 degrees Celsius in the daytime. At night, the accumulated heat is radiated away to the frosty sky and temperatures dive to a bitter minus 30 degrees Celsius. In winter, parts of the northern interior are colder than Earth's surface has ever been. Such are the conditions for life at the heart of the continent. The most remote areas of the central desert have not seen rain for hundreds of years, so where is the water that is essential for life? This region was once covered by warm, shallow seas, formed when sea levels were high and the climate was temperate. Gradually, as the continents piled into on another, the land was uplifted and the shallow seas drained off into deep ocean basins, Rain filtered into the limestone and created a sprawling labyrinth of limestone caves deep below the central desert. At the edge of the desert, constant rain drenches the seaward mountain slopes and soaks into the strata, eventually seeping into the porous limestone of the mainland. Over time, this water fills the subterranean reservoirs that lie below the central desert, giving life to the barren wastes above. The animals and plants that exist in this arid land are true specialists, experts in enduring extremes of temperature they survive through the single-minded pursuit of water. The most successful living creatures in the central desert are insects. For 600 million years, their remarkable adaptability has enabled them to survive the most extreme conditions and weather out all the great mass extinctions the planet has suffered. More than any other living animal, insects are able to diversify into and exploit any number of ecological niches. In the hostile environment of the central desert, insects have found a way to create their own living conditions. The sunburnt surface of the central desert belies the labyrinth of limestone caves and water-filled fish. Years beneath, they stay the same temperature all year, and stretch for thousands of kilometers beneath the desert. To explore this hidden world, it is necessary to look in more detail at its formation. The limestone deposits are a relic of the reefs and muds of the shallow seas that once existed here. As the continents collided, the land rose up, displacing the shallow seas and compressing the mud's reefs into solid stone. Limestone is made up of the shelly debris of marine life and is easily eroded and dissolved by acids in the groundwater. The action of these acids initially creates small pores but, over time, larger caves can result. Despite the acidity of the water and the total lack of sunlight, one group of animal has flourished, polychaetes, a class of segmented annelid worms also known as bristleworms. Normally all life derives indirectly from sunlight, plants convert carbon dioxide and water into food using the energy of the sun, plant-eating animals eat this food and are in turn eaten by carnivorous predators. In the darkness of the caverns, this does not apply. Instead, the initial energy is derived from chemicals. Bioluminescent bacteria break down sulfur compounds in the rocks and grow on the energy released, forming an incrustation on the cave walls. Throughout this complex social structure there seems to be a single, corporate intelligence that understands the requirements of the whole colony. The colony functions as though it were a single organism, its whole truly greater than the sum of its parts. The terabyte is a species of eusocial insect native to the central desert of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. A terabyte colony lives in a large tower, about 2 meters tall, which they build, and is composed of a number of different castes, each with its own role to play. Terabytes are descended from termites, one of nature's great survivors, which easily made it through the 100 million AD mass extinction and developed an even more extreme caste system, as well as more advanced chemical weapons. A more recent ancestor of the terabytes lived in what would become central desert before conditions became so inhospitable. In those days, pools of water were more common, and a kind of green algae floris. Head on the surface of these pools, fed on by the terabytes' ancestors. As conditions worsen, 
the oases disappeared and aquifers sank further below the surface. So the terabytes' ancestors began to burrow down to reach the algae and bring it to the surface to photosynthesize. Eventually, in the terabytes, this would develop into a full-scale farming operation. The various castes of terabytes all have different appearances, but most follow the same basic body plan. Only the transporter caste has functional legs, the others have vestigal legs, or none whatsoever. Several castes including gum spitters and rock borers have disproportionately large heads giving them more room to generate their chemical weapons. Most terabyte castes have internal chemical factories allowing them to generate a wide variety of chemical weapons and tools. Some chemicals secreted by different terabyte castes are acid-based, others are glue or gum-like, and still more function similarly to cement. Terabyte society has rigorously defined roles for every individual, all terabytes are divided into biologically distinct castes, each of which has an important role to play, as they are legless, most of the castes are carried from place to place by transporter terabytes. The founder of a terabyte colony is the constantly reproducing queen, who spends her life in one of the underground nests. Terabytes are highly territorial and aggressive. Terabytes are herbivorous animals, and subsist on a type of green algae which is found on the surfaces of oases, and on the bodies of garden worms. To gather algae, terabyte war parties often march towards nearby pools where they immobilize garden worms and cut the algae out of their flesh. This algae is farmed and grown by the terabytes in the greenhouses of the towers they live in. Although there are rare pools of surface water in the central desert, terabytes draw most of their water from the underground reservoirs below the desert. To accomplish this, members of rock boring and biting casts dig tunnels to the reservoirs, and water carriers fill themselves with water which they expel when they are transported back to the tower. Terabytes farm a variety of green algae found in the central desert in their towers, using it as nourishment for the WH. Old colony Although they are herbivorous animals terabytes must attack garden worms to obtain the green algae in the first place as it grows on the worm's fleshy lobes to get the algae terabyte gum spitters immobilize the worm whilst transporters cut off pieces of its algae-filled flesh a process which does not seriously harm the worm garden worms are not entirely defenseless however and like the terabytes they can secrete a natural chemical own which dissolves the glue spat by warriors allowing them to escape. Terabyte towers which may be several feet high are constructed by the builder cast and are made of sand grains the remains of dead terabyte sand feces the particles of which are all cemented together by a special chemical secreted by the builders a single city of terabyte towers may be built over hundreds of years. Below the externally visible terabyte tower is a labyrinthine system of tunnels and caves hundreds of meters deep dug out by the rock borers and biters these caves house the terabytes nests and are home to the queen whilst the tunnels lead to the subterranean reservoirs from where the terabytes draw their water. The above ground stories are a brilliantly engineered greenhouse farm running down the middle of the tower as a pole supporting several circular platforms on which green algae grows the top of the tower is filled with small windows made out of transparent polymer allowing daylight to shine into the structure and onto the algae the heat from the sun evaporates water in specially constructed wells at the base of the tower cooling the atmosphere inside and causing a convection effect when the air falls circulating carbon dioxide rich air through to the tower the combination of sunlight and carbon carbon dioxide provides ideal conditions for the algae to grow and photosynthesize. At daybreak garden worms come slithering out of the fissures in the rock and spread themselves out to catch the rays of the rising sun they hump up their middle sections and begin to unfurl green fern-like tissues that branch and fan out from the segments of its body. The garden worm is a species of photosynthetic amphibious bristle worm native to the central desert of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. Fours, greater than it has a symbiotic relationship with a variety of green algae, which provides it with a constant food source on its own body. The garden worm is one of a number of polychaetes endemic to the central desert, and belongs to the family Phylobranchidae. The garden worm is descended from a marine bristle worm of the family Trichobranchidae which became trapped in a system of underground reservoirs when the shallow sea was displaced by the formation of Pangaea II and became the central desert. This single worm flourished and diversified into several families, including that of the garden worm, which seems to be the only central desert polychaete which ever leaves the caverns. The garden worm is about 45 cm long and some 3.5 cm high. 
It generally resembles a very large segmented worm, with a large number of short, stubby legs, a pair of short horny projections above its two compound eyes. Its most distinguishing feature is several long, fleshy lobes running down each side of its body, all of which are packed with algae, which turns them green. Other parts of its body, including its face and areas of its back, are also stained green by algae. The algal growths and green coloration make the whole animal resemble a sort of strange plant. It is capable of secreting a chemical dissolvent from between its segments, which is able to dissolve terabyte glue, and a foul-smelling or tasting liquid which repels other animals when secreted in water. The garden worm is semi-aquatic and a fast swimmer, and lives mainly in the subterranean reservoirs which are scattered beneath the central desert. The garden worm's symbiotic relationship with algae means that it never has to seek out its own food, the algae growing in its lobes provides it with all the nutrients and needs. However, in order for the algae to photosynthesize, garden worms must spend a large amount of time each day basking in the sun on the desert surface. When basking, they raise their midsections off the ground by almost half their own length, then unfurl and fan out their algal tendrils. The garden worm has a very close symbiotic relationship with a variety of green algae, which grows inside the fleshy lobes running along the garden worm's sides. The algae creates food from nothing but air, water, and sunlight. T allowing the garden worm to survive in the harsh environment of the central desert. The relationship also benefits the algae, allowing it to photosynthesize when the garden worms bask in the sun for exactly that purpose. Garden worms are also important for terabytes, which harvest the green algae and farm it as their own food source. A special terabyte cast, the gum spitter or warrior, has developed to incapacitate basking garden worms whilst transporters harvest the algae a process which does not seriously harm the worm. Garden worms are able to dissolve the restrictive glue shot by terabytes by secreting their dissolvent. Another animal which hunts garden worms is the slick ribbon, another aquatic polychaete found in the subterranean caverns. The acidic secretions of the garden worm may also be used to repel these predators. The green bacterial meadows of the underground pools are grazed by the gloomworm. The gloomworm is a species of bacteriophagic aquatic bristleworm endemic to the underground reservoirs below the central desert of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. The gloomworm is one of a number of polychaetes endemic to the central desert, and belongs to the family Bacteriophagidae. The gloomworm is descended from a marine bristleworm of the family Trichobranchidae, which became trapped in a system of underground reservoirs when the shallow sea was displaced by the formation of Pangaea II and became the central desert. This single worm flourished and diversified into several families, including that of the gloomworm. Half a meter long animals which travel in groups. Gloomworms feed exclusively on a kind of bacteria which grows on the walls of the caverns below the central desert, and are themselves preyed upon by slick ribbons. The slick ribbon is a fearsome predator. Its jaws are mounted on an extendable trunk that snaps out at passing prey. The slick ribbon is a species of predatory aquatic bristleworm endemic to the underground reservoirs below the central desert of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. It is one of a number of polychaetes endemic to these reservoirs, where it is the apex predator. It belongs to the family Megaphosidae. The slick ribbon is descended from marine bristleworms of the family Trichobranchidae, which became trapped in a system of underground caverns when the shallow sea was displaced by the formation of Pangaea II and became the central desert, this single worm flourished and diversified into several families, including that of the slick ribbon. The slick ribbon grows to about a meter in length, and, like the garden worm, has a long, segmented body. It has a large number of paddles running down the sides of its body, one pair to each segment, accompanied by adjacent bristles which detect changes in water pressure. It has an unusual head structure, with stocked eyes, two ambiguous plumes projecting from either side of its head, and a large mouth with two powerful pincers mounted on a long, extendable trunk. The slickribbon's mouth and tusks are not visible or usable until it extends its trunk to catch prey. The slick ribbon is an aquatic predator which catches its prey by snapping out its long, extendable trunk mouth. It is a swift swimmer, with its multitude of paddles beating in a wave-like action almost like an aquatic millipede, but it is not as agile as its cousin the garden worm. As the apex predator of the caverns, slick ribbons will hunt other polychaete worms including gloomworms and garden worms. 
Gloomworms are defenseless, but the larger and more nutritious garden worms, which are not always present in the caverns, can put up a fight against slick ribbons by secreting a disgusting chemical into the water. The global ocean is a superocean from 200 million AD that surrounds the new supercontinent of Novapangaea. The mass extinction of 100 million AD did not just ravage life on land. Life in the oceans was profoundly affected. 2. Active volcanoes filled the sky with ash and dust, cutting out the sunlight for months on end. Acid rain, formed by sulfur compounds belched out by volcanoes, fell continuously into the sea. The lack of sunlight and the increase of acidity killed off the plankton in the surface waters and led to a catastrophic collapse in the oceanic food chain. Most bony fish suddenly died away, as did countless other marine creatures. Where once the oceans had teemed with life, they became almost barren. But nature does not leave ecological niches vacant for long. The animals that survived the mass extinction did so because they took shelter in the deepest, most remote refuges of the ocean. Once conditions had stabilized, bony fish were mostly replaced by completely new forms of life. It is now 200 million AD. The planet is dominated by a single, giant landmass called Novapangaea. One continent means one ocean, the global ocean, a body of water so vast that its center lies 16,000 kilometers from the nearest coast. This uninterrupted expanse of water helps to determine the extreme weather conditions of the planet. The intense heating of the atmosphere at the equator draws in trade winds from the north and south. These converge and blow westwards along the equator, driving permanent ocean currents before them. The result is a constant equatorial gyre, an immense circulatory current that involves the whole ocean. The global current makes it easy for sea life to migrate. And so the global ocean is populated by very cosmopolitan groups of animals. As the predominant ocean currents run east to west, there is little water movement between north and south. The cold waters of the South Pole do not mix with the warm waters of the equator. The result is a steep temperature gradient between high and low latitudes. However, worldwide temperatures are still too high for there to be a polar ice cap. This single ocean is a complex environment supporting intricate food chains and highly evolved species, quite unlike anything known from the reign of humanity. Why? Sometimes brewing over the global ocean are extreme hurricanes called hypercanes, 50% stronger than previous hurricanes with winds gusting at 400 km per hour. The reason for this is because since a supercontinent is always surrounded by a superocean, the energy balance of the globe changes. There is a lot more energy, a much warmer ocean, much more energy is transferred into the atmosphere, creating more powerful storms. This species of silver swimmer roams the ocean in shoals. A complex array of antennae and bristles at the front of the animal enables it to filter out fine particles of plankton from the water and sweep them into its mouth. The common silver swimmer is a species of social filter feeding silver swimmer native to the global ocean of 200 million AD. It is the most common silver swimmer species, and the most abundant animal of the global ocean. Silver swimmers have descended from marine crustaceans which developed neoteny the ability to reproduce in a larval stage, in the immediate aftermath of the 100 million AD mass extinction. With the oceans almost completely free of fish, they quickly branched out to fill almost all the marine niches. The common silver swimmer specifically fills the niche of fish, and of filter-feeding animals. The common silver swimmer has a large and armored, yet lightweight head, bristly legs on its underside, and a segmented tail which drives it through the water with an up and down motion. A complex array of antennae and bristles hanging around its mouth parts enables the animal to filter out fine particles of plankton from the water, then sweep them into its mouth. Common silver swimmers roam the ocean in large shoals. As a very common and relatively small animal, the common silver swimmer is a primary food source for several species of ocean fish. One species has even evolved to follow migrating shoals of silver swimmers right across the global ocean. It is also a minor prey item for sharkopaths. Ocean flish have filled the niches left behind by the extinction of birds and have taken to the air in true flight. They have sharp teeth on powerful protocile jaws which snap out to pluck prey from the water. 
The ocean flish is a species of maritime flish living around the coasts of Pangaea II and the global ocean in 200 million AD. The ocean flish has a similar R lifestyle to modern-day seagulls and other coastal fishing birds. But since the majority of marine fish are extinct in 200 million AD, the flish feeds on silver swimmers. There are a number of closely related species of ocean flish, including a grebe-like species, a tern-like species, an albatross-like species, an avocet-like species, a skua-like species, and a cormorant-like species. The ocean flish appears to be the oldest and most basal of the flish species, as it resembles its cod ancestors more closely than any of the other flish species. It evolved to fill the niche left by extinct seabirds like seagulls and petrels. Closely related species soon diverged to fill other niches, the grebe flish evolved as a filter feeder, the albatross flish evolved as a migratory hunter, and the skua flish evolved as a scavenger. Unlike its cousins on dry land, the ocean flish has retained the general physical form of a cod, with large dorsal, anal, and ventral fines, which appear to be useless, simply remnants of the flish's former in the water. The ocean flish's large caudal fin is rotated 90 degrees, resembling a whale's fluke. This makeshift tail is used for takeoff prior to flight. A single powerful thrust of its tail can lift a floating ocean flish clear of the surface, allowing the first sweep of its flying fins to get it airborne immediately. The lateral spread of the caudal fin also provides a control surface, allowing the flish to steer and maneuver while in flight. The ocean flish's primary jaw has evolved to resemble the bill of a bird, with blue and red stripes. However, inside the flish's mouth there is a second set of pharyngeal jaws containing teeth. This set of jaws is larger, raw and red, and can be directed to either the left or the right, improving the flish's ability to pluck prey from the water. In order to float on the surface of the water, ocean flish store air in the lungs, have fat reserves around their chest, and are covered in waterproof, insulating scales. Their flying fins can stretch over their backs like sails and their pelvic fins reach into the sea like a keel, steadying the animals as they float. Ocean flish are social animals which hunt in small groups circling the ocean and searching for prey before swooping down and grabbing their food with their pharyngeal jaws. When they need to rest during flight they land on the surface of the ocean and float there buoyed by the air in their lungs and their fat reserves however ocean flish go to the sea only to hunt, at dusk the flocks return to roost on the rocky outcrops of coastal cliff face where they nest. Different subspecies of ocean flish occupied every different ecological niche for a coastal flying animal the most common species played the role of a basic seabird's use as a seagull flying around the coast in flocks and occasionally diving down to catch silver swimmers all species of ocean flish are preyed on by the rainbow squid. However perhaps the ocean flish's most important ecological role is in the rainshadow desert on the other side of the Pangaea II coastal mountain range ocean flish along with other marine animals are cast over the mountains during regular hypercanes and tropical storms their bodies known as flishrex are the only food sources for carnivorous animals in the desert and the bumble beetle requires a flish carcass for reproduction without the ocean flish the entire ecosystem of this rainshadow desert would collapse. The global ocean is patrolled by loose groupings of sharkopaths covering a large expanse of water if one happens upon a prey animal it sets off a flashing sequence in bioluminescent patches along its side this visual signal penetrates the water and can be picked up by the sharkopath's closet neighbor the neighbor repeats the signaling process and soon the whole group of sharkopaths is aware of the presence of food and starts to home in on its quarry. The sharkopath is a species of pack-hunting bioluminescent kitefin shark native to the global ocean of 200 million AD they are the apex predators of the global ocean. The sharkopath evolved from a kind of kitefin shark which survived the mass extinction like the already bioluminescent spined pygmy shark. The sharks survived the 100 million AD mass extinction just as they had survived several previous mass extinctions but the formation of Pangaea II and the global ocean presented them with some problems with a single reek time equals 0.2 s greater than vast ocean pre is now widely dispersed with large stretches of empty water between prey items and a single shark hunting randomly would be unlikely to come across enough prey to sustain it because of this own group of sharks evolved to become pack hunters developing bioluminescence in order to better communicate with one another 
The simple primitive design of the shark has proved itself extremely effective and the Sharkopith's biology is almost no different to that of its human-era ancestors One of its few new features is a series of bioluminescent patches running along its sides creating a light which penetrates the water and can be picked up by a Sharkopith's closest neighbor This bioluminescence is controlled by the Sharkopith's brain. Human-era sharks had highly evolved sensory organs, thousands of small pits in their heads which detected water pressure changes and electric discharges, and cells in their nasal passages which picked up traces of prey The sharkopath retains all of these sensory organs and has even improved upon them, the ridges on its head contain organs which sense the slightest trace of scent. Sharkopaths are pack-hunting animals which patrol to the ocean in loose groupings when a sharkopath detects prey it begins to flash the luminescent patches on its sights alerting its neighbors that prey is nearby as the scent becomes stronger the flashing becomes more and more rapid. Sharkopaths are generalist predators and will hunt most marine animals including silver swimmers but often work together to hunt the enormous rainbow squid which congregate in the shallow waters off Pangaea II's southern peninsula during the breeding season although rainbow squids can camouflage themselves sharkopaths can still detect their presence by using their sensory organs which pick up on the electrical discharge from the rainbow squid's nervous system. Sometimes several flocks of ocean flish will gather above one whirling silver swimmer shoal suddenly a rainbow squid tentacle will snap from the water surface seizing a flish and disappears the shoal then vanishes as well and in its place appears a broader shape, the back of the enormous animal drifting just below the surface part of the shoal is not a shoal at all. Two's greater than but the changing pattern on the skin of this beast. The rainbow squid is a species of highly intelligent predatory squid native to the global ocean of 200 million AD. With a body the size of a finback whale and tentacles of a similar length, the rainbow squid is by far the biggest animal in the global ocean. The rainbow squid is a very large animal, with a body 20 meters long, and tentacles of similar length. Its eyes are about a meter in diameter. It has a very large brain, and is highly intelligent, even more so than human era squid. The rainbow squid's most distinguishing feature is its ability to change color at will by using muscular sacs on the surface of its skin called chromatophores. These can be expanded or contracted at will, produing color changes or flowing patterns over the whole animal. Each chromatophore is part of a complex nervous system and is controlled by a nerve, so the rainbow squid's brain is by necessity immense and very powerful. Some of the chromatophores also contain symbiotic, luminous bacteria, allowing the squid to incorporate light into its displays. Using its chromatophores, the rainbow squid can hide from sight by merging with the green of the ocean, flash up a dramatic light display to scare off potential predators, and produce a flowing pattern of colored patches to mimic the motion of a silver swimmer shoal. Its senses are so acute that it is able to immediately choose the appropriate display for any situation. Human-era cephalopods rarely lived for more than around two years, because they died after reproducing. The rainbow squid has finally escaped this live-fast-die-young cycle and, with almost no predators, can live for up to a hundred years. Rainbow squids are predatory animals which attract prey by changing their appearance to mimic smaller animals. They are usually solitary animals which range across the ocean, but they gather in large groups around the shallow waters around Pangaea II's southwestern cape once a year to breed. On the night of the full moon on the autumnal equinox, the global ocean's entire population of rainbow squids gathers off the southwestern cape, in shallow waters near seamounts. To compete for a mate, male rainbow squids put on vivid displays of color and light, the better the display, the more successful the individual is likely to be in hunting, and the more likely to produce equally successful offspring, so the male with the most vivid display is the most likely to mate. Rainbow squids prey on the various species of maritime ocean flesh, luring them in close enough to catch by camouflaging themselves as shoals of silver swimmers. To ensure they are not themselves attacked during a hunt, they turn their bottom halves the same color as the sky. It is not known if rainbow squids hunt silver swimmers themselves, but it's unlikely the squid can survive only on flesh. Due to their size, rainbow squids have few enemies, but they are preyed on by sharkopaths, pack hunting sharks. Sharkopaths can see through the camouflage of a rainbow squid by using their sensory organs to detect electrical activity in the squid's nervous system.
In 200 million AD the northwestern part of the new supercontinent Nova Pangaea has a truly bizarre and massive rainforest stretching for thousands of kilometers. The region in the northwest of Nova Pangaea is pounded by saturated onshore winds the global circulation of the atmosphere brings constant westerly winds to this part of the landmass winds which travel over a vast surface of warm ocean filling up with moisture as they go thick black clouds roll in from the sea and condense into water as soon as they reach land sunlight is rarely seen here rain falls relentlessly from the overhead darkness drenching everything below. With no mountain range to act as a windbreak the rain-sodden region stretches hundreds of miles inland great rivers carry the runoff back to the sea through swamps and lakes surrounded by deep murky forests with all this water a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere and warm global temperatures forests thrive and grow to immense proportions the tallest trees here are conifers which grow to the same great heights as the giant redwood trees and other pinnails that have dominated this area since the Triassic period. Only a handful of specialized species are able to survive the wet conditions of the northern forest flowering plants are rare in this lush forest they have been mostly replaced by another highly versatile organism, lichen. In the rich habitat of the northern forest there is no shortage of animal life. The low level of the forest is a tangle of lichen trees their trailing feathery structures absorb moisture and photosynthesize their spores bursting from sacs as animals brush biare easily distributed. The lichen tree is a type of large superficially tree-like lichen populating the northern forest of Pangaea II in 200 million AD they are a keystone species of the lichen forest biome. As it is not an individual organism the lichen tree did not strictly speaking evolve in the conventional sense of the term lichens were allowed to grow into larger more complex forms due to greater buildups of dead fungus in the trunk like core thanks to the dark and damp environmental conditions of the northern forest and the lack of competition due to the wet environment and the catastrophic 100 million AD mass extinction. EAK time equals 0.4 s, greater than lichens are composite organisms made out of algaes and different types of fungus, with the fungus providing a protective outer layer, and the algae providing nourishment from within. Lichen trees are sturdy and superficially tree-like in form, and may grow up to 3 meters in height. Instead of the soft fleshy bodies of human era lichens, they have hard, robust trunks built up from dead fungal fiber accumulated in the tree's core. Lichen trees are hollow and fall of small holes, allowing sufficiently small organisms to live inside them. As they are not true plants, they have no leaves, they have only a wide trunk and a number of bare branches. In this way, they are somewhat evocative of human-era dead trees. To photosynthesize and gather moisture, lichen trees trail feathery algal structures like curtains in the humid air. They reproduce by growing large sacs filled with assemblages of both lichen and fungal spores. These sacs explode upon any contact, so their dispersal is easily aided by large animals brushing past the trees. Lichen trees also grow their own kind of fruit, a diamond-shaped lichen pod or lichen tree pod which is used as food by several species. The lichen tree is an important species in the northern forest. Animals such as squibbons and forest flish use it for roosting, and all the known terrasquid feed on its fruits. One species of flish, the hornbill flish, is specially adapted to feed on the fruit of lichen trees, cracking them open with its large, heavy beak. The lichen tree itself also benefits from animals coming near it, as they may burst its spore sacs, allowing it to reproduce. The lichen tree also has a close symbiotic relationship with the slithersucker, a giant predatory slime mold. The slithersucker makes its home in the hollow algal core of the lichen tree, creeping out to drape itself over a branch at certain times of the day to catch prey. If the slithersucker does catch something, parts of the animal will inevitably drop to the forest floor, providing nutrients for the lichen tree as well as the slithersucker. At certain times of day, it oozes along a branch and dangles strands of itself below, forming a sticky curtain. A passing F. Orist flish is easily trapped in the slithersucker's slimy net. Once the flish has been caught, the slithersucker slides off the branch and crashes to the forest floor. There, it secretes a digestive acid which slowly dissolves the helpless forest flesh. The slithersucker is a form of giant predatory slime mold native to the northern forest of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. Slime molds. Communities of microbes that come together to form a single, coordinated organism, do not grow very large in the human era, and feed mainly on microorganisms which are invisible to the naked eye. Because of their nature, 
the slime mold survived the 100 million AD mass extinction, and, with many niches of life left uninhabited, quickly became larger and more organized. The slithersucker is composed of millions of microbes which are acting as a single organism. Because of this, it is capable of changing its shape with ease, can split into multiple parts, and can survive practically anything. It is also capable of dissolving the tissue of animals. However, its movement is very slow, and it cannot travel any significant distances by itself. Slithersuckers live in the hollow cores of lichen trees, coming out at certain times of the day to drape itself over the branches, waiting for prey such as insects or forest flesh to fly into its trap. Once it has caught an animal, it slides off the branch and crashes onto the forest floor, where it dissolves and eats its prey. Larger animals may take several days to be dissolved. The slithersucker has a symbiotic relationship with lichen trees. It lives inside the hollow, algal core of the lichen, emerging through the organism's porous skin at certain times of the day to catch unsuspecting flesh. Any parts of the flesh that are undigested will fall to the ground and be absorbed as nutrients by the lichen, therefore benefiting both organisms. As it is too slow to move significant distances by itself, the slithersucker utilizes megasquid to disperse its microbes throughout the forest, allowing it to multiply. It changes into the shape of a lichen tree pod, which are fed upon by megasquid, and is digested. Microbes then migrate across T. He megasquid's body, effectively taking control of it, and forcing it to sneeze out the slithersucker into another part of the forest. In the gloom of the tangled branches and trailing curtains of the lichen trees, bright little jewels flit about. They are as brightly colored as butterflies, but they dart like wrens and hum like humming birds. The forest flish is a species of small, insectivorous flish native to the northern forest of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. It is the smallest species of flish in the northern forest. More specialized cousins of ocean flish, the forest flish has evolved the capacity to abandon the sea altogether instead being highly adapted to a rainforest environment. Like the ocean flesh, its fins have evolved into wings. The posterior fins have become hook-like feet which enable the flesh to roost. The forest flesh evolved to take the place of forest birds like hummingbirds, which were all wiped out by the 100 million AD mass extinction. The gill of the forest flesh has evolved into several parts. Part of the exterior gill has become an ear, whilst the gill arches in the throat are now capable of producing sound. The rest of the gill has evolved into a membrane to amplify the chirping created by the arches. The green and blue scaled forest flesh is smaller, more compact, and more lightly built than its maritime cousin. Its pectoral wings are smaller, similar in structure to those of a butterfly, and are capable of flapping far faster, up to 30 beats a second. The forest flesh's pelvic fins have evolved into small hooks, enabling them to roost from the branches of trees. With wings capable of beating up to 30 times per second, the forest flesh is agile enough to hover in the air and catch the small flying insects populating the lichen forest. It tends to travel and roost in small groups. The forest flesh communicates by making chirping noises using the gill arches in its throat. Its call more closely resembles the shrill grating of a grasshopper than the fluid notes of a bird. Like bats, they roost upside down, hanging from branches. The forest flish occupies the niche of a common insectivorous forest bird, such as a hummingbird. The flish sometimes uses lichen trees foe. R. Roosting. The slithersucker relies on the flish for food, and in turn the lichen tree relies on it for fertilization. Squibbons are agile enough to occasionally catch and eat forest flish. While the ability to operate tools and act communally reflects an intelligence ideally suited to life in the northern forest, it may be that a changing environment will encourage the development of even greater sophistication. Perhaps a reasoning type of intelligence will evolve once again. The squibbon is a species of highly intelligent, arboreal terrasquid native to the northern forest of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. As the most human-like animals on Earth since the human era 200 million years previously, Squibbons may develop human-like culture and society in the far future, and presumably evolves to dominate the planet just as humans did. In the wake of the 100 million AD mass extinction, the terrasquids evolved to take advantage of the niches left empty by many animals. The squibbon fills the niches of brachiating animals and small, swift arboreal hunters. In the future, squibbons may evolve greater intelligence, and perhaps even a civilization. 
They are already capable of using tools and even weapons, and are highly intelligent, so it is possible that a change in the squibbon's environment may lead to it developing even further. Squibbons more closely resemble their marine ancestors than the megasquid, both in size and in body plan. Their torso is small and vaguely oval-shaped, and, as with regular squid, they have eight long, flexible legs and two pairs of smaller tentacles. These two tentacles are equipped with highly developed suckers or suction cups, which form highly flexible finger-like or pincer-like protuberances. Their eyes are set on muscular, flexible stalks. Squibbons are the most agile of the terrasquids, and, with no skeleton to hinder their movement, are far more effective swingers than human-era animals such as gibbons. Unlike gibbons, they do not brachiate, swinging one arm after the other, instead, they loop end over end in a continuous somersaulting action, keeping their stocked eyes level with the body's center of gravity as they do so, ensuring they are always looking towards the next branch. Their large brains and sharp vision enables them to navigate the forest canopy at high speeds. Highly social animals. Squibbins live in family communes and build simple, nest-like structures in the uppermost stories of the forest. They are the most intelligent animals of 200 million AD, with complex and close family bonds and social structures. Like humans before them, squibbins are capable of using tools. Young squibbins learn by playing, and the colony is quite capable of working together as a whole community. Squibbins are omnivorous and feed mainly on plants, fruits, and lichen pods, but they may also eat small animals which they catch with their tentacles. Young squibbins sharpen their senses and coordination by chasing other animals. The suction cups on a squibbin's tentacles form finger-like protuberances which are so flexible that a squibbin can manipulate small objects and even use simple tools. They have even developed the use of weapons to some degree, as they will sometimes brandish branches as clubs, and use fruits and lichen pods as thrown projectiles. Omnivores, squibbins will eat both small animals such as forest fish, and fruits like those of the lichen tree, in which they may also build nests. Chasing animals such as flish can sharpen the senses and coordination of squibbins. Careless squibbins may end up caught by similarly omnivorous megasquid, but the colony will always defend their own by harassing the megasquid with fruits and spore polyps, or swinging down and rescuing the endangered squibbin. They may also fall prey to slithersuckers. Heavier than an elephant and almost as tall, the megasquid pushes its way through the soaking vegetation, splintering conifer trunks and pulping the branches of lichen trees as it goes. The megasquid is an elephant-sized species of terrasquid native to the northern forest of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. It is the largest land animal of its time. The cephalopods have been slowly adapting for life on dry land since 100 million AD, with the large Bengali swampus octopus. However, they only truly began to evolve and diversify after the 100 million AD mass extinction, which wiped out most large life forms on Earth, with many empty ecological n. Icheset was the squid not the octopuses which evolved to be the dominant animals the megasquid in particular appears to have evolved because of the lack of large land animals like the swampus the early terrasquids dragged themselves across the land but the megasquid's ancestor eventually developed legs. The megasquid is 4 meters taloned weighs 8 tons physically it appears to be very different to regular squid, however save for a few differences they are very similar to a squid but tilted vertically. The main body is the most like that of a squid with a large mantle and small eyes this mantle as porous as air can flow through it to reach the lungs and keep the animal alive the small brain is located just behind the eyes. However everything below the mantle is strange and foreign its eight limbs have evolved into one third of a meter thick column like legs reminiscent of elephant or sauropod legs these legs are composed entirely of circular vertical rings of muscle in addition it has two tentacles at the front of its body which are used as arms picking up and manipulating food unlike the highly evolved legs these tentacles are similar to the tentacles of a modern day squid. Set in the very center of this network of legs is the megasquid's beak-like mouth the anus would appear to be at the back of the animal just under the mantle and the location of the reproductive organs as you known. On the front center of the mantle above the megasquid's faces a large blue vocal sac the megasquid uses these sacs to generate deep booming calls for communication the megasquid's entire digestive and respiratory systems seem blended together they breathe through their vocal sac which is connected to the anus suggesting that the stomach is in the same tract as the lungs the sacs also act as a nasal passage. 
The skin of a megasquid is not what one would expect from a squid, it is tough and rhinoceros-like the skin of a megasquid is generally brown with lighter stripes on some individuals to keep itself from drying out. 0.2 s greater than the skin of megasquid secretes some kind of liquid. The megasquid is a slow, omnivorous animal. It will eat anything that presents itself, from lichen tree capsules, squibbon, and disguised slither suckers. The tree capsules are commonly targeted because of their bright color. Megasquids have excellent color vision. Megasquid locomotion is difficult. They are very slow and have a very specific way of walking. The front and back right legs are moved forward with the middle left legs, and then the same the other way around. If megasquid moved in any other way, they would overbalance or trip over themselves. Megasquid can live up to a maximum of 50 years, at least partially thanks to the lack of large land predators on Pangaea too. Megasquid communicate with each other via large blue vocal sacs on the forehead area of their mantles. They produce different sounds from low grumbling or humming to a loud boom. The sounds are made when a megasquid breathes in a certain way. Megasquid use their anterior arm tentacles as hands, grabbing food with them, and generally using them as tools, for tasks such as moving obstacles. Megasquid are used by slithersuckers as a method of dispersal. The slithersucker tricks the megasquid into eating it, and then takes control of the giant squid's central nervous system by inflaming its brain, and causes it to sneeze sending bits of the slither sucker around the forest. This is not harmful to the megasquid. Megasquid also eat squibbons. However, occasionally the tables are turned somewhat, and squibbons will taunt passing megasquid from the trees, throwing things at them and swinging around. 